Um, let me just introduce us and explain a little bit about what we're going to be doing uh, in this session. As you know, it's a workshop session rather than just a presentation. Um, for starters, I'm Chuck Cox. I teach in the college writing program in CAS. And my colleague is Betsy Cohn of SIS. And what we're going to do is we'll say a few words at the beginning about the rationale behind the panel, some of the ideas we want to explore and offer. We're each going to share one of our own creative assignments that we've used in our classes just to build on the theoretical side of it. And then the main event is to break you into groups, which is part of why we wanted you to sit with more similarly disciplined people, to do some brainstorming of possible new assignments that you could use for your own uh, classes. And then come back together as a full body to share some of the not only the ideas you came up with, but some of the questions and considerations that arose as you talked about it, and see what kinds of um, you know, insights we gained from that. We also have a couple of documents that, most of which are available up on Blackboard, and one of them is a list of, of, of assignments. So we're only gonna tell you about one of each of ours, but we have a whole bunch from various uh, departments, as well as some resources around the campus that can help you with developing creative assignments and, and injecting new ideas into your teaching, and uh, as well as some of the actual assignments themselves that we're describing, the, the prompt sheets will be up on Blackboard as well, in fact already are. So, we, should we do intros first? Yes. Okay, so even though we're a large group, we thought we could have <coughs> folks just introduce themselves, and since you're already arranged roughly by teaching unit, we thought as a way of further drawing some distinctions that might be useful, if people could tell us their name, and on a scale of one to 10, with one being least comfortable, 10 being most comfortable, how comfortable are you with injecting creative assignments? Are you, if you're closer to the nine, eight, nine, ten side of the spectrum, you're someone who uses creative assignments regularly, thinks outside the box with your, with your assignments. If you've never done it before or are only just sort of getting used to it, maybe you're at the one, two level. That way we might be able to pair up people with similar experience or comfort levels uh, when the time comes. So uh, I've already told you I'm Chuck Cox and I would on that scale rate myself at about a nine. I try to keep things wacky in my class to keep the interest going. And I'm Betsy Cohn from SIS, and I would say I'm a 10. So. <laughs> At least in terms of creative assignments. <laughs> I'm so happy we're led by nines and tens. It would have been scary if you'd said you were twos and threes. So that's awesome. Uh, Karan Martinez, I'm in the college writing program. And uh, I would say I'm probably more like a seven. And so hoping to boost my numbers by being here. Um, Derek Tokas, also in the college writing program. Uh, it's my third semester, so I'm actually not sure what the box entirely is and which of my assignments are normalish and which ones are just <laughs> kind of out there. So pick whatever number you like for that. Okay. <laughs> I'm Daniel Dreisbach. I'm an SPA, and I would probably be about a six. John Heath, SIS, five, aspiring to be 10. Uh, Lauren Carruth, um, I'm an SIS, but I'm a medical anthropologist, and so um, I would say five or six. Ben Gunther, I'm the economics department, probably go around with five. Comfort level is like seven or eight, but how much I actually do is like two or three. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Saranya Rodriguez in the chemistry department. I would say that depends on the class, but I about like five or six. Um, I'm Joe Lynn Gardner and in the Department of Health Studies, um, probably a seven. Mary Frances Chandria, history. No, are there any other college arts and science that history or? I'm not sure which one of them I'm supposed to be on. I can't 
Joan Cummins. I'm in the history department, but my teaching work is in the theater department, um, and I am probably at an eight. Uh, my name is Mike Knoxon. I'm also a student at the candidate, and I'd say my comfort is nine and getting that, and hopefully I'll send that back eventually. So. I'm Rafi. Uh, I'm an MFA graduate student, and I'd say my comfort level is about a nine, but I get graded down. It's not a clear anymore. So, <laughs> uh, Anthony Bruner. I'm also an MFA student in the School of Communication, and uh, I like all my colleagues. I'm about an eight or a nine, and getting appreciated for the career. So. Yep. Sam Sheline, same deal, MFA uh, candidate in SOC, and I love getting creative assignments. I've done a little bit of teaching outside um, of AU, and I found it tough. teaching number is a lot lower than me receiving. <laughs> I'm Michelle Hernandez. I'm um, also a student in the MFA program. Um, getting the assignment is like say about an eight or a nine. I'm Samantha Hogan. I'm a master's student in SOC. Um, I'm helping with the research course for freshmen. Um, so I personally am very comfortable with maybe like an eight or a nine with getting them, um, but helping students find their own creativity within a research project is probably like a two. <laughs> I'm Wei Wang, and I'm in the School of Communication as well, MFA program, and I'd say my comfort level is an eight. I, um, so here's the thing, I, I, um, obviously I, uh, I don't speak and I don't hear, so my creativity is, is eight uh, in, in my own creative ways. As a, a deaf person though, I would, in, in visual ways, I would say 10%. so many students, uh, it's going to be an interesting sort of dynamic to, to have different perspectives like that. Um, well, before we get to having you do a little bit of work, I want to start off and, and give some background so that those people who aren't necessarily where they want to be have a sort of stronger grasp of what we're, we're talking about today. I guess I should start by defining what exactly we are talking about when we say a creative assignment, because obviously we're not all teaching say, creative writing or art, that the, the, the places that are traditionally considered creative, I, I always kind of bridle at that distinction because I think all writing is creative, all intellectual work is creative when it's done well. But what we specifically are talking about in this, this session are assignments that sort of meet one of two broad criteria. Either assignments that kind of break free of traditional conventional genres and forms the research paper, the policy brief, the individual presentation, the sort of standard genres that we, we see more often. For example, videos, blogs, or even things like literary journalism, sort of writing forms that are not typically uh, taught in the academic classroom. Conversely, a creative assignment can be one that is traditional in form, but takes a creative approach to that form, whether through the topic or the way that it's uh, the process of getting to that form. For example, many of my colleagues and I in the writing program, because we are teaching uh, students from all across the, the university, we are finding ourselves trying to teach the skills without focusing too much on a content area because uh, 
we are touching students from all over the campus. So some of us have started using a traditional research essay, but with a pop culture topic. So students are taking something that's very new and current and familiar to them, but bringing it into a scholarly research situation. So it's a, the, it looks traditional, but the topic and the way they get there is, is, is atypical. So we're interested in both of those sorts of approaches, whether it looks like something entirely different or whether it looks the same but has taken a different route to get there. So why is, I guess, the next question. Why would you want to use creative assignments? And there are a lot of reasons why taking a more creative approach can be beneficial in a lot of different courses, a lot of different disciplines. Obviously, you want to encourage students to demonstrate skills and knowledge with any assignment. Sometimes a creative assignment is more apt at fulfilling that goal than a traditional assignment. Perhaps there's a, a way of thinking or a way of writing that you want to encourage that isn't necessarily captured by an existing genre that really requires an inventive new way of, of executing it. Maybe you see a lack or a problem in students' capabilities in a traditional assignment and that might be solvable with a more creative approach. You also can challenge students. We see a lot of complacency in students. They're, they know they like to go with what's safe and comfortable and familiar. And so giving them something creative shakes them up a little bit and, ma and makes them sort of think about things from a new angle. It can also shake up a class, an entire class. If you have a class that gets a bit complacent, they start phoning it in. They're not really engaged. Switching things up with a creative assignment can re-energize the classroom, can get them back. Or the opposite end of the spectrum. Maybe you have a really sharp class, a lot of motivated students who really want to be pushed. This can be a way to give them that extra push, uh, to, to tap into that energy. It can also, on a more practical note, be a way to try to minimize plagiarism. If your assignment is utterly unique to your class, there's little chance they'll be able to buy a paper from the internet or use something they've written for another class. Likewise, it can add interest and variety to a course. Uh, if you've been teaching the same course for years and it's a little stale, maybe you can jazz it up with a new approach to a new assignment. Creative assignments are not just good for them, they're good for us too. Uh, and it can also push us. Sometimes we as teachers get complacent with our own methods and our own ways of thinking. Tackling a creative assignment may be a great way to push us into new territory, make us think about it. And one of the things that does is also forces us to think about why we value what we value. What is it that I want students to learn? How can I get them there? That mental exercise can really be useful in clarifying your own pedagogy for yourself as a teacher, which can only make you a better teacher, I think. So those are some of the reasons, and I think they're complex and intertwining, and I think they can really be uh, beneficial on a lot of levels. So. As with anything that's creative, I had a great student years ago who used to wear a backpack he had bought at a uh, museum gift shop that was emblazoned with the logo, Creativity Takes Risk. And I loved that. I, I made him hold it up regularly in class. And I think anytime you're doing something creative, there's an element of risk involved. And so also we wanted to talk about some of the challenges that a creative assignment can, can create and things that you need to consider. The single most important thing that we think is important to remember is that any assignment, but especially a creative assignment, needs to start with the learning objectives. Start with the goals that you want. What do you want students to learn? What do you want them to demonstrate? What skills, what knowledge? Yes, it can be fun, but the fun is in the service of the learning. And that's the single biggest problem, I think, people sometimes face when they create a creative create a creative assignment, there's a nice redundancy, is that they let themselves get caught up in the whimsy and they forget that there has to be some kind of pedagogical reason for it. And then as part of that, you need to build that assignment with an eye toward how it fosters the skills. So starting with the skills. And then, of course, it should be apt for the course itself. It wouldn't do any good if the, if the assignment was outside the kind of domain of the course you're teaching. At the student level, you really need to make that intellectual value explicit. They need to know why they're doing something unusual. Some students will resist because they think it's too whimsical or too silly. You need to show those students that, no, this does have an outcome and a value. You'll have students who resist because they don't think of themselves as creative or they don't want to rise to that challenge, but you can show them that, oh, no, we're doing this for a, for a very good reason, and, and it will be a benefit. 
And then you also need to be very explicit in the directions. Because creative assignments is uncharted territory for, for you and the students. So it's important that you lay out what is it that you're going to be doing. The written direction, you need to be explicit and careful. You need to offer a lot more guidance. You can't just assume, oh, it's a research paper. You know how to do that. Well, maybe if it's an unusual assignment, they don't know how to do it. So you'll need to offer examples, whether those are published examples or students' examples from the past. Likewise, you'll probably need to do more scaffolding, whether that's through analyzing examples in class, looking at models, giving them process assignments, having them check in with you at different stages of the process to see that what they're doing is in line with what you're envisioning. And maybe even workshopping. You with the students, students with each other. And at the end of that process, you really need to be explicit with your evaluative criteria. Because a creative assignment isn't necessarily something that looks like what they're used to, they may not understand what they're being assessed on. And you need to let them know, here's what I'm expecting, here's what you will be uh, graded on, essentially. And that needs to be explicit and clear as well. Basically, it's just you have to kind of go on the journey together and really be sort of aware of what each other expects at each step of the way. And as I said, there's a handout we're going to give you. There are plenty of resources on campus, including, for example, CTRL, not to mention the New Media Center in the library, which is an excellent place if you have no experience with multimedia, uh, the, the game lab that we recently added to campus. There are a lot of different uh, resources, and we have a handout up on Blackboard that will um, guide you to those. So these are some of the, the considerations and questions. It's a way to approach something in a new way, but as with anything that's new and different, it takes a little bit of extra legwork. But when that legwork play pays off, I think it really pays off. Is there anything you wanted to add about the big picture? I, I wouldn't add anything. No. Okay. So what we're going to do before we break out into groups is each of us would like to share just an example of what we've done as a creative assignment just to give you something more concrete and then we'll, we'll move into, into hearing from you uh, and, and you hearing from each other. So one of the, I told you that, that one motivation for a creative assignment could be a lack or a need, something you're noticing students aren't getting from a conventional assignment. And, and my colleagues in the writing program will back me on this. One of the hardest things to teach a first year student when it comes to research is the idea of research as an exploration. Research as a search for something and not, they often come in seeing it as, I come up with a claim and then I hunt down the best evidence to support that predetermined claim. And it winds up closing them off to other points of view, they don't learn anything, they, they ignore important issues. Or, or, or a, a variation of that is they think, oh, I need to find a few sources that say what I want to say and then piggyback on them. You know, the sort of their argument becomes what they said. Uh, and so I was thinking about ways to try to shake them out of that. And nothing was working, you know, forcing them to write good research questions, forcing them to find certain kinds of sources. Like it worked up to a point, but they still couldn't shake this mindset. So with that in mind, I ended up coming up with what I call my speculative argument assignment. And all of the uh, examples of this are up on Blackboard. It's a con this is the example of the conventional form with a non-traditional approach. At the end of the process, it looks like a standard research-based argument-driven paper. But their research question that they started the process with needed to be speculative. That is, it needed to start with the words, what if? They could either imagine an entirely alternative reality. What if JFK hadn't been shot? What if Earth had two moons? One of them that was popular among the female students. What if men could get pregnant? Uh, or it could be something that imagined a possible future. What would happen if we developed a way to fully clone a human being? Um, what will happen if we improve drinking water in you know, sub-Saharan Africa? Things that, that are unknown, but in the future. And then they had to conduct research to try to answer this question. And then they had to answer the two companion questions. It went from what if to then what, what follows, what are the implications, and most importantly, so what? When we come back to reality, what have we gained from this intellectual exercise of speculating? And 
it was a fun assignment. It's, it sort of gets them thinking in interesting ways. But the real benefit of it was I took away all of their safety nets. It was almost impossible for them to find a source that answered that what if question. People don't just write like that. And so they had to synthesize. They had to find data, theories, arguments related to the topic. They had to research the reality. They had to research theories and ideas that might help, help them make that argument. The argument had to be their own, and it had to come out of their exploration of the research. It also required them to use very, very careful logic. If your argument is speculative, it's got to be built on some pretty strong reasoning because it's all hypothetical. So it had to be a combination of using a diverse array of sources and lock-solid logic. And then it also showed them that, that non-traditional thinking can be used in traditional ways. They had to bring their speculation back to reality. What do we gain about history, about the developing world, what have you? So seeing how creative thinking can be applied to, to very, very mundane and, and important issues. They also found themselves energized a lot because at first they're energized because it's fun, it's quirky, you know, they get to do something kind of off the, off the beaten path. But soon, once they started to realize this was a real ownership issue, this was definitely going to be their argument because they couldn't just piggyback on someone else's argument. It gave them a lot of, the, the ones who really took to, to the assignment to heart really found a lot of um, ownership of the argument and the research. So a lot of good came out of it. But it took me a few semesters of working out some bugs. I learned a few things. Like I said, you have to be willing to experiment and willing to be explicit. They needed a lot of hand-holding when it comes to choosing topics. Not every speculative question is good for research. Some of them are just plain silly. Some of them are so far-fetched, there's no way that you could do it. Um, also, examples. Even though they were writing a traditional research-based argument, they were really unsure of what is this going to look like. And so I was able to find there are some really excellent articles and books about counterfactual history, where historians imagine alternative timelines, things like this. There are some scientific articles that, that postulate, uh, things like that. So we looked at examples. How do other people do this? You also need to guide them away from what I call the black and white trap, the tendency to think that, oh, what if? Well, if this happens, the world is going to collapse into doom and gloom and destruction, and, or the alternative leads to total utopia, that to see things complexly. And of course, it required to really teach good logic. So that I, I knew that I suddenly had to beef up my teaching of logic to them so that they had those tools. But at the end, I think it really worked out well. And I, I used it into, oh, another thing I learned quickly was scale. Uh, they couldn't really, they could come up with good arguments, but they couldn't necessarily sustain them for more than six or seven pages. So I started with this as a really big research paper, more in the 10 to 12 range, but they were getting a little thin so I scaled it back to about five to seven, and now they could really kind of focus them. So the point I'm gonna make with that is that experimentation, you have to be willing to try it. You have to be willing to see, and, and I think if you go into it with that kind of creative experimentation mindset, even with the students, they knew that we were sort of taking this trip together, that we were doing something that was outside the realm of the usual. I think it, it helps to kind of bond the class as well. So that was my assignment, and uh, I have the not only the core assignment sheet up on Blackboard, but some of those process assignments I had to use to give them the guidance, to help them with developing the question, figuring out the logic behind it, figuring out how to build the speculation. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, about the assignment, uh, especially uh, if you read it and take interest. But I want to make sure that Betsy has some time to talk about her assignment. So You are good on time management. Me? Next year. Okay. Next year. Look for it. The workshop I need on a workshop time on time management. And I'm going to be the Yeah. So I'm going to stand up for a second here. And um, so I, we have a handout here on, with several <coughs> assignments that are possible that you might want to use for creative assignments. And I've done quite a few. And uh, but the one that I wanted to share with you, if it's something that would be of use to you, would be on doing professional blogging. And I know that some faculty use, how many of you do have your students blog on the uh, uh, readings for class, in class, the assigned readings? Okay. 
Does anyone do uh, where you have the students use, using WordPress, where you have them do a blog, where the, it's like a, essentially a 700 word essay building on current events related to course content? Is that something you'd be interested in perhaps incorporating? I could see the languages doing it. I could see the like SIS and SPA. I could see even SOC. I'm not sure about the theater. Uh, maybe. Should I sh sh would you like to see that? Yeah. All right. So I'll just show you. Let me tell you why I do this, just as Chuck has pointed out here. I teach a course which is called Breakfast. I, I do this in two classes, both upper level courses. And um, the idea, I'm going to need Nikki. I just got unconnected. Yeah, there I am. You are so good. Thank you. <laughs> just the mere sight of you in it, it it's my like goodness. So I use WordPress, and I do this in these upper level courses because in a block class that meets 14 times, there's only so much of the course content that I can deal that I can address in the course. And I always have students like, you didn't do enough on the Caribbean, or I wanted to do more on Brazil, or I thought there'd be more on the environment. I sort of like, okay, okay, I get it. So what I did was I developed this blog assignment where the students have to do four blog posts, which are essentially 700 word essays, and two comments. And they're, they're, I put the uh, due dates throughout the semester so they can't do them all at the last minute. And so it gives them a chance to follow their passion. And what I found was that by uh, th their, s their satisfaction with the course went way up because they were no longer just sort of stuck in one research paper that they had to work on throughout the semester. It fit with the sort of ADD-ness of all of our students now. So they, had one they were essentially writing four short papers. I mean, it's a 700-word essay. But what I, what I, and they also have to then compile them into a portfolio at the end. And this is all on a seven-page handout that I've written and is posted on our Blackboard site. And it tells you what is a good post. It tells you also the last three pages are the technical aspects of using WordPress. So I've written that for everybody to use. Please just give me some credit. And the, um, the last thing they have to do is a concluding essay about the blogs that they read and the assignments and writing this assignment, writing these blog posts, how that uh, in, uh, affected their learning. And the one I get over and over, uh, I, I'm not going to take the time to read them, but what I essentially get over and over is usually I'm allowed to meander along for 15 to 20 pages to get to my point. This assignment was really hard because I had to do it in 700 words. And, uh, and you know, my favorite was the student who says, let's be real, I hated this assignment. <laughs> But it was because of that. So uh, this is what the blog looks like on WordPress and the way that I did it. And it was in part because I had a fabulous graduate assistant, but because I am not even that, that technologically adept, as you've already seen. But he even, he just sort of said, look at this. Every time you click on it, you get a different breakfast in the Americas, bananas, coffee, sugar, and sun, all these fabulous images. So you can play with that. And uh, just to give you a sense, so there's the home and explains what the blog is about, or the course. Oops. Then there's, this is a blog curated. It's only for my students. You could not find this online. It's private. I didn't think that was fair, as because it, it's a learning assignment. And so it's not for everybody to see. So it's only for members of the class, and even though it's free using WordPress. And it's available also then on the Google, using the Google platform. And then I put the blogging guidelines up there, as I said. So let me just show you, just to give you a sense. So throughout the semester, let's say there's, uh, I'm not so good at math, anyone from the math department here? But there's th there, uh, 30 students in the class, they have to write four blog posts. So you get a lot of blog posts up there, plus the comments. And so it's very important that there's be, that after the first paragraph, that 
it, um, see that kid didn't do that. I left that there on purpose. See, because if you didn't have the first, you have to, there's a little thing you have to do, uh, a little button to push so that you hide the rest of it so that you only get the first paragraph. It's all in my handbook for the students and for you. And so this just gives you a sense. It goes on and on and on. With These are the, all the articles my students wrote all semester on all these different topics. So that's really unwieldy to try and figure out uh, what, so let's just say we wanted to read just about economic development because the students, maybe they're interested in economic development and so they'll like first read on the blog what's already been written. And so they read about, uh, now it all depends on whether the student has properly categorized and tagged the article which you have to teach them and it's all in my handout. And uh, so those are all in economic development. But then we can look to the right. There's also this way where the, the size of the words up here ha ha correlate with the number of articles. So the more times Mexico, say Mexico, students wanted to write a lot about Mexico. And so I can get to only the articles that are just about Mexico. I even left the misspellings there. That should be heroin. And but uh, that's all right. So, but then I want to maybe just see what one student had to write. So I just want to see what Elise, who, by the way, got an uh, internship writing a blog for an NGO based on the fact that she had learned this in one of my classes and took a second class. So she was able to use the skill to actually get a unpaid position, but it was better than working at two Amy's, which is where she was the rest of the time. And uh, so let me just give you a sense now. I click on here, and I'm teaching about immigration, U.S. immigration policy. Elise comes up with this fantastic article that she writes about, I had no idea, the United States government had a program to target through the media, to the, through the radio, in Central America, to keep the migrants from coming to the United States. And she found this by doing all this research, because she was sort of interested in they start. So the advantage of this assignment is it takes students where they are, which is they're Googling. But then they have to learn how to make it into a more professional academic assignment and they can't use any kind of source. They have to learn hyperlinks, which is the equivalent of a footnote. So this is about La Bestia. And we can skip the ad and find out that this is this song that the US government wrote, uh, or had written, and was appearing all over the radio in Central America to tell the immigrants not to come to the United States on this train because it was dangerous. I didn't include that in my curriculum, but the fact that she did was so fantastic. I'm not, I didn't hook up the sound, but you know, so that's just one hyperlink. And and that's just one of the many um, uh, <coughs> oh, so that was a different one. So anyhow. And you want everyone just to pick their own topic? And yeah. So I'm gonna stop here on the on the blog on the blog itself. Um, because I gave you a sense of it. it. What it does is allow the students to pick their own topics. It allows them, it, and, and it forces them to choose one point that they want to develop in 700 words. And then it forces them to find the evidence to, uh, through the hyperlinks to, de to support the arguments that they make. So the structure I lay out is essentially what they learned was the five paragraph essay. But it is really forces them into one point and that they get to follow their passion. And I let them do whatever they want. But I would say if um, initially I, I made them pick two categories, let's say 
you know, U.S. foreign policy and immigration, but then I just said let them do whatever they want. Questions on it? Does it work as well for graduates as undergraduates? I don't, uh, I would ha raise the bar. Think about as a graduate student, uh, I haven't done it in a graduate student class. I always think, what was the purpose of doing this? And if you want your graduate students, or if they're going to be working at think tanks, or they're going to be working in public communications for the government, doing the social media aspect of it is a very important skill for our students right now. So I would say it, it can, but I would raise the bar. I would develop it a little differently. Is that on? So I have two questions. One was, is there interactivity among your students where they're commenting and reading each other's blogs? They have to post two comments, and I get every single year that I've done this, I wish we had commented more on each other's. And I was like, <laughs> have at it. Yeah. yeah I, I, I asked, and their feelings would get hurt if they weren't commented on, so I would say, please comment on one that doesn't already have a comment. But there's, it's just a question of what's realistic. Because there's also on my handout uh, what counts as a, a realistic, was a, as a, what makes a good comment as well as a good post. So you, have, you have guidelines for what those comments should look like. Yes. As well. Second quick question. That's obviously not the kind of research standard writing you're used to doing. To what extent do you have to engage in writing instruction about the tone and the style and structure of what a blog post is? I give them examples. And... This is the this it is much closer to a traditional academic writing than you would think, because it's not in inform. There's no informal language. There's no slang. Think about the professional blogs that you read. You know that I go to Brookings. You know I'm an SIS, so if I read on Brookings, their Inter American Dialogue, or whatever I'm reading, I have also a blog role that gives them blogs that they uh, should read to get a sense of what's a professional quality of writing. So you're giving them the responsibility to look at models and then to imitate and... Early on, I give them an example. Uh, just think about, it again, and apply it to your discipline on uh, some of the assigned reading. I assign blogs. You know, foreign, foreign affairs and foreign policy have blogs. They're really just short articles based on a contemporary issue where it offers either a new perspective or a slightly different uh, understanding. It's not a rant. Or the other thing I would tell the students, which is, uh, or it fills a news hole. So like like Elisa's on, a, you know, on the train there, it, on the public communications, that filled a news hole. So a teacher need not think, I can't do that assignment because I'm not a blogger, no. I'm not a writer, I don't know how to give them I am not a blogger and I'm not. Have them figure it out. I give them examples, and I, I'm basically, I created this assignment because I wanted to go where they are. Uh, what do you give them feedback? Is that like their final version, or do like, because you know, on a traditional paper, you, you hand it back, a couple just like red, right? So I have them submit the first one electronically to me, and then I put comments all, I do comment uh, bubbles. Like Google Doc or something like that? No, in, I just in do box. it individually. Oh. No, individually, they have to email it to me. Uh, and then I will comment electronically and send it back to them. I keep that, and I give them a provisional grade, not a real grade. And then I say, after that, I cannot grade every single one of these. And you, that provisional grade is uh, erased once you revise. And I count that a lot and when their final portfolio is submitted, which I have them submit to me in one Word document, because I'm not going to go through and look at every single one. Yeah. It's all on the handout, where they have to submit one Word document, and that, and if they haven't revised the first one, they get dinged quite uh, harshly. Thank you. Neil? Talked about like uh, providing models for the students with these assignments, and Chuck, you mentioned like having specific criteria for grading. Yeah. And I wonder how many of these lessons actually apply to traditional assignments as mm -hmm. well, or or what like we in the academy now think of as the traditional assignment, mm -hmm. because starting grad school not too many years ago, the first assignment I had was do a close reading of you know a section from this novel. And to me, a close reading was an assignment I'd never done before. I was not familiar with the genre. 
I never seen anything, you know, in that whereas I read blogs all the time, so that's not an unfamiliar thing to me. And sort of mm -hmm. how, like, would it make sense to treat traditional assignments almost in the same way? I mean, I think that it's all genre awareness mm -hmm. and audience awareness, uh, as well as I think that's part of the explicitness that you need to have when you use a creative assignment. I think, um, obviously, for my assignment that I described, the end product is very much a sort of, it looks like, you know, a, with an MLA works cited page and citations mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. But others that I've done don't look much. I think part of the, the written guidelines and when you talk about it and when you assess it is to sort of make clear how this is transferable. Mm -hmm. That's something I, I probably should have highlighted more strongly in the introduction is that just as you need to be clear, what am I expecting? What are the steps? What's the value of this? How is this useful in other contexts? And I, I told you that the reason I did my speculative essay was students had this tendency to do the research in this really limited way. I told them that too. I was very open with, here's why we're doing this assignment. It's not just because it's fun and interesting and cool, although it is. It also, it's stretching your minds in ways that I think need to be stretched so that when you come back to doing a traditional research question, you know that you're not looking for the magic bullet source that's going to give you all the answers. You're constructing an argument from multiple places. So I think being explicit with all stages, why you're doing it, what you're expecting, what they're gaining, how they can push it forward. And I think that's, that's true of any assignment, but I think it's doubly so in a creative assignment because they may not make those connections right away. And I think you're right. Sometimes the, because they're not used to, say, a close reading, you know, all of my first years have not written an annotated bibliography, and they don't understand why that's valuable. Until they do it, then you can sort of draw the connection, see how you... Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it is a lot of, there's a lot of, um, of scaffolding and a lot of peeling back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz to sort of let them know why you're doing what you're doing. It's all part of explicit teaching, like making sure they understand that every step of the way there's no mystification. So there's another question, and then we want to break up, if that's okay into pairs so you could talk, well, uh, go on. Are those four blogs related to one another in a sense of a, I no. guess what I'm saying is I'm teaching a Vikings course and they have a research paper. I would love to do something different because I'm really tired of Vikings on the head of a research map. So, <laughs> so could they do this? This is in lieu of a research paper. Right. So Absolutely. So, but the points are, and they, they can be separate points though. They're writing on four different topics. I mean, it depends on what your course is about. Yeah, I think yeah. I this is new. I did print out a few copies of my blogging guidelines. I, want to do this. See I think you could easily set it up where they pick a broad topic area and then write four posts that are somehow under that umbrella but distinct from each other. I think that'd right. be really it interesting. But do I not care that they build an argument, I, I guess, is what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? That traditionally, in oh, a I see what you mean. they build an argument. No, no, no. In one blog post, they build an argument about, uh, but it has to be really narrow. Right. And that's a big mistake. That's it's the most common mistake students make is they want to sort of broaden it. Right. But this is what every single student says to me is this has helped them in writing their bigger research papers. Yeah, exactly. Because you have to t pick one point and develop it. And go deep. And to go it's deep. And so they really learn writing. It's essentially a 700 word essay. Yeah. And I'd be happy to show you some examples. I didn't want to uh, do that without the student's permission, but I'd be happy to show, and I can't uh, add you to the blog because of your still work. Does anyone else want a copy? So what we're hoping to do now is put it all back on you. Um, think about, well, what assignment are you bored of? What assignments are giving you trouble? What teaching needs are not getting met by whatever it is that you're doing? Or what do you want to try different? And think about the needs, think about the, the kind of difficulties, and then how can maybe one of these, either something that's inspired by the list or something completely different. Um, this, is a, this is a workshop, so it's a chance to just sort of play with ideas and bounce ideas. 
uh, whether it's something written, something audiovisual, uh, something, you know, heck, bring back the diorama. Um, you know, if you can justify it, I mean, and, and it has right. learning objectives, go for right. it. Right. So if you take a moment and just look at the handout we gave you. With, uh, so we've discussed the professional blog. I had students do a, do a video, eight to ten minute video, documentary and TED talk, music video worked really well. Two students who are not the strongest writers did the most amazing rap video. <laughs> and it gave the impression, this was for freshmen, and it was 10% of their grade. I wouldn't give it a large percentage, that's the other thing, is make it appropriate. Uh, a, Judy Shapiro in SIS does this grant proposal. If the assignment sheet is on Blackboard that in a, for our workshop, fantastic and then and she said every single time she has to throw it right back at him because it's just about what they're going to read and they're going and it's just and now her students get more Fulbright and Borans than you know than any of uh, than any other rest of us in SIS. Off campus things too I have a lot of a number of colleagues who I mean Karan you do the use of the memorial monument yeah. essay mm -hmm. where rather than having them do just library research get them off campus to go right. inspect a memorial look at a neighborhood um, you know, visit a museum to sort of inspire research. There's all sorts of ways that you can open it up in a creative way, whether it's the form, the topic, the approach, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. The last one I'll mention is on the back side, poster presentations. Mm -hmm. SAS has done this really effectively with research assignments. At the science, the hard sciences do it, but we have the students, the, because of what we were doing, the provost bought a large format color printer, which is in the basement of the library, so for about 20 bucks, the students can make a very professional looking poster. And, our, uh, and we do have a list of resources mm -hmm. yes. that's on Blackboard that tells you exactly how to uh, access this. And so what we do is we set up easels around the room, and you have half the class present their, presen their, post their presentations. They have the three to five minute elevator speech and happens all at the same time. So it's just this very dynamic uh, set of presentations, and everybody just walks around five minutes, and they walk around to get most of them, and then you have a break, and then you switch, and the ones who are, you know, half the class presents and listens, the other, and then you switch it. So what it does is you no longer have those deadly class presentations that nobody listens to, and instead, the students have to engage, learn how to talk about it. They get to ask each other questions. It becomes so much more lively. So there's a visual component. And there's a visual component. On the, it's on the now library website. We, um, we did this in SIS, and it's now for the whole university, on what makes the format and the structure of a good poster presentation. So it's all up on our university website. Because I've, I've done some like in class presentations before, and it with you know each a time. class of like 20 students each taking five minutes takes that's a why, week of yeah. class. Yeah. Basically. Well, I know that's so why I'm saying you do yeah. this in two hours, you would do yeah. it in two yeah. class periods if mm -hmm. you it's a twice a week class or in one block class. Yeah. And you're done. Exam period. Oh, I do it during okay. the final exam period. Yeah. Yeah. You t get the easels or you have them put, and it's just mm -hmm. you have half the class go for an hour take a break, and then you have the other half of the class present. So it's simultaneous. Okay. It's simultaneous. And if they know you're going to be vigilant about time, it's the same as with the blog posts. They know they're going to have to zoom in, get right to the point. And you can present, you can even give them questions to ask mm. the presenters. Ask them about whatever your discipline is, whether you want to know about methodology, their research, uh, the most difficult struggle they had with, you know, with one, res one, one source? How do you know how to trust a source? How did you come to those conclusions? Whatever works yeah. for you. Isn't it good at cacophonies? You've got the yes. simultaneously. Yes. Oh, yeah. Possible. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've done, I've done similar things, and it's just, it's, it's, because it's a different kind of cacophony. It's a really productive one. <laughs> and when you use your magical teacher ears to just listen to this one over here, like, you realize there's a lot of good stuff happening. So our intention so, yeah. now was to have you break up into disciplinary Rock. pods of duos or triads and come up with some ideas that you would want to do. Are you up for that? 
And really, like, okay. it's pure brainstorm. Like, it doesn't even have to be practical at this point. No, you can always, I want you can it in always, your syllabus this semester. <laughs> you can always, that, that's the thing, like, you tell students, right? Just go out there and, like, be crazy. You can always scale it back. So how much Dream time this. do they have? What, what's, when are we done? When are we done? 3.40, oh, yikes. So you have 10 minutes, and then we'll come back together and share concerns or, uh, okay? 10 minutes? That sounds good. 12, 10 minutes. And we want exciting things. Or not. I have a degree in writing. That means I stopped writing as soon as I got my degree. Yeah. <laughs>
Inform your life, and then and then research. They could do research before the interviews, so you're informed on what to ask the people, and then follow up research on issues that arose during the interviews. And then the interview, the, the argument was, how does this individual or these individuals' experiences complicate an understanding of the topic? Yeah, that's something that I like to talk to my students about. There's a lot of the. Uh, like the intuition with academic writing is often to like lean towards statistics and hard facts. So if you want to talk about like the damage from like Hurricane Katrina, so X number of houses destroyed so many billions of dollars of damage. But I don't know what a billion dollars of damage is. That is just a number. Whereas when you right. use like the stories of like this family had to like leave their home, they moved to Dallas. It took them so many years to be able to move back or you know, moving back to their home just wasn't even possible because of, you know, the fact that they had to become a staff somewhere else in the meantime. Like, well, now I can extrapolate to that happening to 100,000 people. Whereas if you just tell me 100,000 people lost their homes, I don't fully understand what that is because I have to have to be And building in that narrative and that storytelling actually serves a purpose to get me right. to larger events. It helps them navigate general and specific yeah, another set of ethics, which is an argument they build on. There are a lot of ways you could do it. I um, mean, you, you can have them interview, you can have them. We have a colleague, Jocelyn, who does this brilliant research assignment where it's based on a book they read, where she has them choose a family story from their own family experience and apply a specific research based lens to that story. So I forget what was the, one of the examples she uses. Um, so, for example, if your grandmother always tells that story of how they emigrated from Russia and yada, 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 well, what happens when you put your grandmother's experience into the context of historical migratory movements? Or what happens when you look at the psychology of migrants? Or what happens when you look at... That's a jumping off point right. that goes deeper into research and society. And then you can weave your family story into your research. Okay, we have six minutes. Yikes. One of the things you learn about creative assignments is I think it'll be easy. Oh, nicely done. Yeah. All right. So what do we want to do? We haven't. We don't have time to hear everything. But maybe if your group had one or two like knockout ideas, or even just the beginnings of ideas. Obviously, you know, we're not expecting a fully formed assignment with all the trimmings. But if you had like a, a kernel of an interesting new idea. Um, share. Or, or conversely, a particular issue or question that you found yourself. Uh, we, I was just talking about how do you integrate narrative and story into a research assignment in, in a way. And that, that's another sort of way to think about creative assignments is how to sort of merge forms and merge ways of thinking. What other either ideas or questions and topics arose for you in your groups? Let's start with one idea before we get, at least, there before we get to questions. I know that there's always questions. Someone 
God, give us a great idea. Can I have a question? No. <laughs> just some. Just I made a question for the all of us. No, no, one really good idea. Or mediocre. I want a mediocre <laughs> idea. Yes. There we go. Yeah, so oh, with the first one, where you have them ad address the reading from a different perspective, yeah, I, why? I, um, What's the learning objective there? This is a creative writing in Spanish. So mm -hmm. I hear a short, a short story, let's say, one short story about what it is. Mm -hmm. So there is a, an, a, a, could be written from the first person perspective, or so it's to teach the creative writer. So they have to rewrite that short story from another point of view. Mm. Great. Yeah. But also to change from first to maybe third person. Yeah, to work oh, with so the grammatical knowledge. To yeah. the, so as long as there's a reason, because otherwise it seems like busy work. Mm -hmm. No, right. it's not a busy work. Well, no, <laughs> there's a reason. Now I get the reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. good. And a, any other great idea? We didn't really talk about this in my group, but something that I am interested in doing more of is um, when I am trying to explain uh, like an economic situation to um, students in this program that I work with that's um, sort of like a hybrid high-speed theater program, uh, I will run a simulation with them using like Jolly Ranchers or Hershey Kisses or something, and they sort of you know, if you have to be the king and I say, okay, you owe me three Hershey kisses because there's a war on, and then he like runs out of Jolly Ranchers and he's like, oh, now I understand what's happening and why it's a problem that the king doesn't have any money. <laughs> great. Yeah. Simulations and playing out roles. Yeah. Role playing is really great. The game lab. Yeah, and then they, and then they get yeah. to eat it. And then they get to eat it. Yes. All right. Objects that are edible. I like to have students seek out experts on the campus for interviews. Do we have a sense of if people appreciate that or if that's a problem? I don't know. I would say it is a real problem. I get, because I have a narrow topic, I guess, but this has happened for the last two semesters. Right at the end of the semester, mm. students are like wanting to do interviews with me, mm. and I find it really difficult. Mm. But, um, so I would have as somebody that had a problem with this last semester, I would have them do it early on the semester. Do it early. Or at least plan it early. <laughs> Set up the interview as early as you could. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, questions? Yes. So if you don't mind too much of getting to see the sausage get made, like what we did was a creative assignment in this, and I was wondering sort of what the <laughs> thought process was so that we can see how sort of you know, like what you were thinking about in terms of like the learning objective to see how that translates into like the project we just did to sort of, because I'm still up in the air. I'm like, how do I think through how to translate like my objective to the assignment itself? I think we, I mean, yeah, I mean, we were, obviously we could have sat up here and lectured you about every assignment we've ever done, but we wanted you to be active because that creativity is an activity. It, it's, it's not a, it's not something you just observe or hear. So forcing you into, well, I mean, did you ever notice how when you say you gotta think outside the box, you're not thinking outside the box, you're using a cliche? Mm -hmm. Sorry, just a side <laughs> observation. <laughs> side observation. Forcing you out of that sort of thinking of, you know, if, if we just said, okay, I want <clears throat> all of you to sort of tell us an interesting idea you had, it would be painful. But 
making you work in groups and bounce ideas off of each other is a is a that's how creativity it's, happens. Well, and also I've done a lot of these workshops and I've sat through panels where they didn't apply at all to anything I do. And so we wanted to ge generate some ideas for you, but then have you sit in your discipline so that you would generate ideas that would work for you. Or to hear from other people. So that was almost like, like a form follows function kind of thing yeah. as far as the actual doing of the assignment goes. But I think so. Form and function do go together. The, like the actual process of the assignment, where it's we, kind of right. that, the correct feeling for the assignment. We could talk afterwards, but time is up. Yeah. And one of the things you've learned about doing creative assignments it is time. it takes time. <laughs> so think small, integrate as you can, but just I will reiterate, what's your learning objective? What is it you want the students to either learn or even in terms of knowledge or skill? And to demonstrate. And, it's, and, and, and like anything with creativity, it takes Trial and error, practice, you know, the and first time you do it, it might not be brilliant, but you know how to adjust it the next time. Right. So thank you all for playing. Have a great semester.